Well, good morning, everyone. Summer's almost over. Can you believe it? I think there's like 120 days left to Christmas. I don't know. Somebody will be on their phone in the service, I'm sure, to look at it. But Well, we had a pretty heavy word last week. We went through quite a bit, and it was a message that needed to be told. And as we go into Romans chapter 11, we're going to continue on with the kind of the same theme that we went to last week, but we're going to try to stick more to the scriptures because that is our job. But there's something that is very true, and I want you to hear me very carefully this morning. We live in a day and age where Christian obedience to the word is neglected. Therefore, it should not surprise us then that there's an appearance in that the Christian church has been rejected. If you were to go to your local supermarket and try to get yourself some fruit, you would quickly see that the rejected fruit is often the neglected because it is rotten. Rotten produce serves no purpose whatsoever except to feed the flies and the pigs that get attracted to rot. Now the scriptures that were just read are telling us a very important statement in this terms of Neglect and rejection. In fact, the very first verse the Apostle Paul delivers to us is a very important declaration. It's a critically important reality that deserves our contemplation. And that is, in the the context of Israel, that God has not rejected his people. Has he? May it never be. You see, there's a lot of neglect rejection, and rottenness that is actually going on in the Christian church today just as it was in the days of Israel. But we must also understand in such a statement, it's not because that God has rejected us, it is because we have rejected Him, the church. Israel rejected the Messiah. They rejected the message of the gospel of grace. And for the most part, the Christian church has done the same. We'll unpack that later. In fact, we learn quite quickly about such rottenness. And if you go to the book of Judges, we don't need to turn there, but in your own time, in your own reading, make a note that if you go to the book of Judges, chapter 2, you will learn a great tragedy has taken place regarding Israel. And that is that Yahweh declared to his people that he alone is the one who brought them out of the land of Egypt. He alone would be the one who does not break his covenant with his people. And in doing so, he makes a wonderful demonstration that he is indeed a God of mercy and a God of grace. But there was a condition. There was a condition, and that condition, Yahweh's people were not to make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land. They were to break down the altars. They were to break down the idols. They were not to incorporate them in their worship or in their lives, but they chose to disobey, and the gods of the land would become their snares. And if you look around the Christian church today, you would see very clearly that the gods of our land have become the snares to the Christian church. If this is not true, then I am gravely mistaken. But it would appear that Christianity follows the same trajectory that Israel followed. And that is idolatry. Idolatry comes in all shapes and all forms. In fact, idolatry even comes with making an image of Jesus Christ that's not found in Holy Scripture. For many professing Christians, they have this fantasy They have this idea in their head about who Jesus is. In fact, if you were to give many people the gospel and you would share with them the gospel and you would say that this is who he is, you will hear the quickest term with Christians, well, to me, God is. And in saying those words, they are crafting an idol. An idol could be your reputation. It could be your career. It could be your family. It could be your spouse. It could be your church. It could be yourself. But when you boil it all the way and you look at the cause of idolatry, it comes to one thing. Because the scriptures have shown us consistently Israel's idolatry was stemmed in what? Disbelief. Disbelief. It was an unbelief. That's what idolatry is. 
It is an unbelief. It is a failing to take God at his word. It is a failing to trust God's provision. It is failing to follow God's decrees. And therefore, when an individual, a person, a church, any nation, it doesn't matter when we walk away from the true living God, idolatry sets in because we no longer have a belief in God and his word. And therefore, we create for ourselves all sorts of idols and all sorts of images so that we can worship and bow down to. And I would say this morning, dear friends, dear brothers and sisters, that the church most certainly needs a reformation. And when I say this, I am not talking about the reformation like that of our fathers, of Martin Luther and John Calvin. No, no, I am talking about a reformation that we find from King Josiah. A reform by destroying all the vessels of Baal and of Asherah that have infiltrated the church of Jesus Christ. That there would be a cleansing. That the altars would be destroyed because of all the idolatry that is present in this day and age. And so when you look around at the Christian church in Canada and the Western world, when you look around all the entertainment and all the things going on in the pulpit and all the programs that have no gospel presentation in them whatsoever, we come to the reality that humanity, mankind, and many professing Christians indeed love the idea about Christianity. They love to know about God, but they don't want to know God. And the evidence is that the people have neglected God. The church has rejected God. And that is why the visible church for the most part is rotten. And make no mistake, rotten fruit is not fit for the king's table. So the eye can see, the spirit can feel that there's something going on in Christianity that a large majority indeed has neglected God in their failure to believe God. We can also take a great rejoicing. Because the scriptures tell us, though we have failed, God never will. We learn very quickly that God has not rejected the church just as he has not rejected Israel. No, no. God is the one who selects the fruit. He is the one who picks the fruit. He is the one who keeps the fruit. And that will make sense in a little bit. So we're dealing this morning with the rejection of Israel. But in doing so, we can rest this morning because of what the rest of the scripture excuse me, what the rest of the scripture says. So let's go back. Romans 1, or excuse me, Romans 11, verse 1. I say then, God has not rejected his people, has he? May it never be. For I too am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. So Paul already makes his answer to that challenge by showing who he is. But what we learn just because God, it's about God's chosen people here. And just because God's chosen people, Israel, have indeed neglected Jesus Christ the Messiah, it it does not mean, excuse me, that God has failed in his purpose and delivery of salvation for all people without distinction. And it also means just because they have neglected and rejected, it does not mean that the message that the Apostle Paul was speaking was an error. Last week I spoke about the visible church. That's a very important term. It's a term that you must remember. It is a term that we must always define when we're talking about these issues. It is the brick and the structure of the institution that we call church. But we must remember the connection that we have with Old Testament Israel, the Old Testament people. Because there, as we've gone through this book, as we have been unpacking, we've learned that there were many people who professed to belong to Abraham, to be children of Abraham, but the scriptures make it clear they were not. There are many people who declare to be God's chosen people, but they were not. And it's the same in the Christian church. The churches across our land, in every building, in every denomination, in every pew, there are members who sit in the very seats who have never come to full salvation in Jesus Christ. They have never been truly regenerated. And what they do then, like Israel, they say, well, this is who I am and this is to whom I belong. But their life and their testimonies show that they indeed are not part of God's people. That's hard, isn't it? How, how dare I say that? 
How dare a pastor in arrogance declare that just because somebody might go to a church that they are not a Christian? Well, Jesus had to deal with this with the Pharisees, talking to the scribes and the Sadducees. In fact, in John 8, 39, we learn that there's a conversation taking place that leads up to this point, and it's them saying, we are of Abraham. Abraham is our father. This is the the scribes and the Pharisees. And Jesus' answer was, if you are Abraham's children, do the deeds of Abraham. And so I say, if we are calling ourselves Christians, do the deeds of the Christian. But he went further to show a great depth. He went to show the depth of the neglect and the rejection and the rot that was going on within this pharisaical system, within this religious system of these people who are professing to belong to Abraham as their father. And in John 8, 44, we hear words that would get many men thrown out of the very Christian church if they were ever dare preach such words. And he says to the religious, the religious elite, You are of your father, the devil. And you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature for he is a liar and the father of lies. Just because you are of Abraham does not mean you are Abraham's. In fact, the Apostle Paul makes the very same charge in Romans chapter 9, verse 7. Nor are they all children because they are Abraham's descendants, but through Isaac your descendants will be named. Brothers and sisters, allow the severity and the seriousness of God's word to penetrate the heart this morning. Think upon the historical context of the text. Think upon the tangible religious expressions of the ancient times. Think upon the robes and the headdresses and the sanctified vessels. And think upon who Jesus is talking to with these men and their heads full of theological knowledge, but they were dead. That means we could go to many churches filled with theological truth But if the Spirit's not there, the church is dead. Today, across the lands, churches with their high steeples and their magnificent cathedrals, the modern-day megastructures inside and out, there can be sounds of great doctrine. There can be all kinds of theology. But as I said last week, there is no holy presence. There's no holy reverence. And this is why there is no spiritual endurance. And just as a majority of Israel failed to believe, a majority of professing Christians failed to believe. This is the meat and potatoes of what Scripture is getting at. It's that Israel failed to believe because they no longer relied upon him and they altered and edited and made something that it never should be. And here's Paul preaching a message of the gospel of grace, and they're rejecting it. They are rejecting because they do not believe. That is why they are in idolatry. Again, though, this does not mean God has rejected his people. Not at all. The text has already shared this. And that should be reassuring for all of us this morning because it's telling us that the reality of our salvation is not dependent upon us. It's not dependent upon your denomination or your Bible translation. It's not dependent upon your theological framework or your ability to dissect specific doctrines. No, salvation is always of God. You cannot lose it. You cannot have it slip away. It cannot walk away. It cannot do anything because it is not yours to simply blow it away. 
Psalm 3.8 makes it clear salvation belongs to our Lord. Jonah makes the same declaration in Jonah 2.9. Salvation is of the Lord. And Israel is learning you cannot earn it. Your robes, your garments, your theology, your system, your temple, all your sacrifices and everything you do, you cannot earn this. It is free. It is from God. He has delivered it. Salvation by grace through faith in Christ to the glory of God alone. And they could not comprehend and many people in many pews in many churches still cannot comprehend it. God did not neglect. He did not reject. He has always been the initiator and the preserver of his established covenant. The true church, the true church of Jesus Christ have always been recipients of his most marvelous grace. Election is in the hand of God alone. Our uh, our adoption is not based upon anything outside of Christ alone. Christ alone. Remember that. Say it over and over and over again. When you're struggling about are you good enough, are you smart enough, are you able to walk enough, remember it is by grace through faith in Christ. Christ alone. He is not just our only hope. He's all we have. He is everything. He is better than breath itself. But Israel could not understand this. And that is why it cannot be removed. It cannot be destroyed. And that is important because remember the spiritual condition of Israel and look around Canada at the spiritual condition of the church. We have entertainers and pulpits. We have men giving these little soft fruit salads opposed to a full meaty meal of God's word. You have Christians filling every pew who enjoy sexual immorality and lying and thieving and coveting. And they do all sorts of evil. They rip off their bosses. They yell at their wives. They cut people off in traffic. They don't even help the homeless. And the world's looking in going, where is the true Christian church? Has God rejected it? Never. It doesn't matter what we may see with our eyes. The true redeemed are evident. But are you ready for this? They're never the majority. They're only the remnant. The remnant. So we can see a great neglect We can see that there is a rejection. We can even see that even in our day and age that there is a great rot. But he is always working through his people. Always. This is why Paul used himself as an example. Back to the text. I say then, God has not rejected his people, has he? May it never be, for I too am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people to whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah and how he pleads with God against Israel? Remnant. Here, Paul, an Israelite. If God has rejected Israel, then he would have rejected Paul. But Paul saying, here I am. A Jew, an Israelite, a child of Abraham. God has not turned his back upon the Jews, not at all. But again, terms are important. Was it Israel as a nation? Was it Israel as an ethnic people? Or was it Israel as God's chosen people? The ones to whom God chose. Because of all those who claim to be of Abraham, God is the one who chose his people even out of that group. God has not rejected his people to whom he foreknew is what the scripture says. And we're here then this morning to show that those who profess to know God have indeed rejected him. You see why there's a big difference between profession and possession? Let me say this again. People who have professed God have certainly rejected him. The testimony of the prophet Isaiah is so true for our time. Isaiah 29, 13. 
The Lord said, because this people draw near with their words and honor me with their lip service, but they remove their hearts far from me, and their reverence for me consists of tradition learned by rote. A.W. Tozer says, Christians don't tell lies, they sing them in church. We go to Bible study and talk about living a sanctified life only to get out at nine to live a life of immorality and corruption. Everyone? No. But many who profess to have walked down the Roman's road would make the Romans blush with their immorality. Those who profess Christ as king murder through abortion. They are corrupt. They deal with evil. They profess to be saved, but they fail in grace and mercy as well. And no matter how bleak it may seem or how rotten it may appear, God has not rejected the people to whom he foreknew. As it was with Israel, and the reality is that God cannot, he cannot just forget his covenant. He cannot just forget the promises that he made. It's an interesting word, foreknowing. It means to befriend someone in a certain way before they ever met. God didn't look down the quarters of time and go, I see Sally and Johnny and Susie through his little romper room mirror and go, well, since they're going to pick me then, they are the elect. No, he looks and says, I will save Sally and Johnny and Susie, and I have determined it before the foundations of the world was even set. So what do we do with Israel then? That's a really good question. I'm glad you asked. Because in answering that, we can ask the same question, what do we do with the Christian church? The Jews who actually believed in the message of the gospel of Christ was few. If you look at the letter to Rome, what was the early church of Rome consisted of? Mostly Jews. So they were being saved, but it was a small fragment, wasn't it? So the only conclusion that we can make that if God was saving a small few then in an established religious setting, he's only doing the same work today. Many people can profess. Many people can confess. But how many people possess? Language is important. Because the scriptures are telling us that God is not simply done with what he is going to do. He's not simply writing off everyone and everything. No, we can't say that. That would lead us in all sorts of trouble. But Paul understands the language, and Paul understands what God is doing. And that is why he makes the reference to Elijah. In Romans 11.3, we see it quoted. Again, if you are new or visiting here, we have switched over to the NASB because I am a preferred reader of it, but it also helps us because when you look on the screen, you see all those capitalized letters bringing you as the reader of God's word to go, Old Testament reference. Something's going on here, it's Old Testament, and here it is. They have killed your prophets, they have torn down your altars, and I alone am left, and they are seeking my life. This is the reference that the Apostle Paul's making. He's making a reference to 1 Kings 19. Isn't that an interesting reference that he's making? Because if you know your scriptures, you know Elijah goes up against the prophets of Baal. You get your altar going, I'll get my altar going. And all of a sudden, they start jumping and dancing, and he mocks them. Maybe your God's on holidays. Maybe he's going to the washroom. I mean, clearly, why don't you cut and shout louder, and let's get going. And finally, everything happens. I'm going to use a modern-day translation. Don't get all, you know thrown off here, but all of a sudden they're all done and all this mess and Elijah's kind of sitting there having, hold my beer for a moment. Watch watch what God's about to do. Not in his might, not by his power. Put some water on it. Put some more water on it. It's not me who's going to do this. Douse it. And then he prays. And the power of God comes down and consumes everything that was there. But what else happened? Oh, yeah, we don't like the rest of the story, right? That he slaughtered the rest of all the prophets. It wasn't like it was just over, right? Like a hockey game. Okay, go on. Take care. He's like, kill them all. And Ahab goes back to a person we should all know, Jezebel. 
this is totally paraphrasing. This is like a really sloppy message Bible translation. So he goes back to Jezebel. You wouldn't believe what happened. Elijah does this, boom, boom, back and forth. You kidding? Go back and tell that man that he's going to die just like them. Now you would think after watching the heavens rent open and the power of Almighty God come down and consume the entire sacrifice, Elijah's going to consistently sit there and go, I ain't afraid. I got this. Me and my God. No, what does he do? He runs. And he hides in a cave. He's fearful. And in that context, you read in 1 Kings 19.10, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword, and I alone am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Does that not seem like modern day Christianity? That when one or two faithful men rise up to preach, it seems like the majority of the church is coming against that one man or that one sister who has something to say. When it all seemed dark, when it all seemed hopeless, when it seemed like Israel was entrenched in so much idolatry and evil, just like I would say much of Christianity is today, when Elijah's sitting there going, basically, am I the only one left who actually loves God? God answers him in verse 18. I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that not have bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed them. It's the reference of the remnant. Elijah couldn't see it. Many of us can't see it today when we look around modern day evangelicalism. But God is saying, I have faithful, faithful people. I have my chosen who I have not forsaken. I have my remnant. Listen, my word cannot fail. It never will fail. It's not by what you see. It's not by what you feel. It's by what I said. And Paul makes that connection then in verse 5 when he says, In the same way then there has also come to be at the present time a remnant according to God's gracious choice. God's people are the remnant. The message that Paul is preaching, this is going back almost seven sermons ago, it does not matter if Israel is rejecting it. It doesn't matter if Israel is fighting against it. It does not negate what Paul is saying. The gospel is true. The gospel is sound. The message is right. And it doesn't matter even if if Israel seems to be rejecting it, it doesn't make it obsolete or wrong. It is true. For Paul, Israel appears to be rejecting, to be rejected by God. But the reality is it's Israel who's rejected God. They rejected. For the Christian church appears God has in a way rejected us as well. The visible church. The Lutherans, the Presbys, the Baptists, the Wesleyans, the Anglicans. I give it all. What am I missing here? Any other ones? The Pentecostals. Throw them under the bus too. The visible, organized structure. It appears to what we see when it comes to authentic Bible preaching, authentic gospel proclamation that almost every denomination has walked away. But... Even though they have rejected God like Israel, there is a faithful remnant. Always a faithful remnant. Now you may be sitting here this morning, you may be a visitor. You may not be accustomed to how I preach, and I may have offended you. And even if you've been here a long time, you may be going, how, pastor? How have we rejected God? How have we rejected him? We come, we pray, we sing, we give. How have we rejected the Messiah? Tell me how we've rejected Christ. Do you not know that we profess him as Savior? Fine, okay. But do you live as if he is your Lord? This is the challenge. We as believers need to be reminded that we do not worship a different God of the Old Testament. So many Christians, they only look at the New Testament and they only read about Jesus and they fall into an old heresy of Marcionism and what they say is, well, that's the God of the Old Testament. He's angry. He's wrathful. I don't want him, but this Jesus is pretty cool. 
He's more relaxed. He's loved and peace and grace. So I'm going to worship him. No, no. It is the exact same God. God cannot be divided at all. So it's not like we worship the God of the Old Testament or the God of the New Testament. In fact, that very statement is very dangerous if you don't know theology. But within that statement, it needs to be said that we have one God. One God who exists in three eternally, three co-equal, three co-eternal persons. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That means the way he operated in the Old Testament is the same as he is now. You cannot say Jesus is not wrath. Oh, Ryan, as Vody Bauckham says, get to the end of the book. Why do I share all that? Because remember what it was said in Deuteronomy 11, 26 through 28. Our one true God says this. I'm setting before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing if you listen to the commandments of the Lord your God, which I am commanding you today, and the curse if you do not listen to the commandments of your Lord your God, but turn aside from the way in which I am commanding you today by following other gods which you have not known. Now some of you might be tripped up going, hold, hold, hold on, Did, that's in Deuteronomy. Did God really say that? Well, we believe that all scriptures breathed out by God, so yes. Cursing and blessing. You follow what I say, you will be blessed. You disobey, you will be cursed. I wonder if Jesus said anything close to that. Luke 6, 46 is a very gentle reminder. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? So do we. He's given us two ways, the ways of blessing and the ways of cursing. You either have Jesus as your Lord and Savior, or you are damned. You have either accepted his gift of salvation, or you are lost in your sins. There is no such thing as great Christianity. You are either in or you are out, and if you are out, you are damned for all of eternity, and you will be found weighed and wanting, and you will be in hell. We can't toy with this. His love is so amazing. It, the song declares, it demands my life, my all. He has given us a way out. He has given us that salvation through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And he says that whoever believes upon him will be saved. Choose life. But for many Christians, they feel that they can toy with this thing. They feel that they can call themselves, just like Israel did, religious. Just enough God, just enough knowledge. I'm going to get in based just on my merit alone, and it's all destroyed in Christ alone. So let me answer that question about how. How have we neglected God? How have we rejected Him? How have we not lived as if he is our Lord? Do we do as he says? And the answer is no. I've already blown it a thousand times today, friends. We all have. God tells us to remember him. He is the God who brought his people out of the land of Egypt, and we should have no other God but him. Yeah, we haven't, we're actually brought out of Egypt, but guess what? We were brought out of Babylon. We were in the bondage and the death of our sin. We could not save ourselves. And he delivered us with a greater miracle. He didn't part no dead sea for us. No, he brought dead people back to life by the very breath of his spirit. So we are to honor him and remember him. He says, do not commit idolatry. Do not make for yourself any graven image of anything above or below. But we consistently say, that's too hard. So I'm going to follow this Jesus. I don't like that command. I'm going to go this way. He says that we shouldn't have pride. We say, well, I'm going to have pride. Don't judge me. Don't critique me. Hey, to me, God is. Do not use the Lord's name in vain. Go on the QEW and see how many Christians can follow that one. Blasphemy. Christians. 
to use those terms, OMG, except for the full term, and they throw it around. And if you don't commit actual blasphemous acts, you, we are okay with watching a movie that consistently blasphemes the name of the holy God into whom we serve, and it doesn't even penetrate our spirits. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Here's one. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Now, thankfully for many of us, if you go to different churches or you're aware of what's going around the world, well, most pastors have taken care of that one for you. They just locked the door. So, I mean, your sin of not going to church is going to be on them, not you. And every pastor who has denied any person to come into the corporate worship setting since 2020, I mind you, you pray for them, you plea for them, because they will give an account for every soul that they turned away. But, remember what I used to say before, the pandemic? A nice summer day will clear the church quicker than the flu. The golf course. But even if we do go to church, many people here right now are probably thinking, dude, shut up, I gotta get out of here. I got stuff to do. I gotta shop, I gotta go here, I gotta get to the vet, I gotta get to the game. We don't honor the Sabbath day anymore. We don't rest. We don't take one day, forget Sunday, but one day out of the seven to stop from our toils, to stop from all that we are doing, to simply meditate and think upon God. Five, honor your mother and father. Now some of the parents are here like, yeah, did you hear the pastor? But even in our 40s or 50s, we don't do that in our heart. Do we know we're not to commit adul uh, adultery, right? Come on. Do not commit adultery. Jesus says, I tell you, if you even look at someone with lust in your heart, you've committed adultery with them already. Matthew 5. Some of you men... And women have no problem watching a movie with somebody else's daughter or son appearing on the screen in a way that we should not be looking at them. And for some people in our churches, they're lusting over the person sitting in the very next pew. Do not murder. Hatred in your heart for a brother. We walk around with our pharisaical robes, right? They're long, they're beautiful. And I look up and, hey, Rob, yeah, Tony guy, you know what he did to me? I just want to punch him right in the face. And everyone's like, yeah, I get that. I get why you want to punch him in the face. Yeah, it's righteous anger, right? It's hatred. Hey, guys, I am not up here saying I've lived this. I am right there, and I am just getting beat by this text, okay? I am a sinner saved by grace. Do not lie. Huh. The righteous lie Christians like to call it, right? You're all going, what about the Eighth Commandment? Do not steal. We leave work early. We cheat on our taxes. We take pens at the doctor's office. That's stealing. It's not yours. You didn't pay for it. CDs. We don't have Napster anymore. We have Spotify, but back in the day, half of you probably had illegal music on your computers, and probably some of you still do. Movies? Come on. The last one, do not covet. Hey, man, I don't see you at church anymore. I got to work. I got to work seven days a week, 26 hours a day. I mean, Jonesy over here, he's got three boats, a car, a garage. I want that. We're not satisfied with what God has given us. We're not satisfied even if we have a one-bedroom apartment and a can of soup. We complain that we don't have two cans of soup in a two-bedroom apartment. This is how we are rejecting him. We're never going to hit this. We're never going to be perfect because it's obvious. The two greatest commandments are this. Love the Lord your God with your entire heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. We can never fulfill the Ten Commandments. That is why we need Jesus Christ. But the reality is we cannot continue to simply ignore sin and have the mindset of Israel that it's going to be our way. How can it be on Sunday we get here and we sing how great thou art and we leave with our hearts just full of anger and Bitterness and unforgiveness. Worse, this one's going to get me in trouble. How many churches do we have to have 
And the banner that's over the church is humanism. Relativism. Socialism. And LGBTQ. We praise churches for the very things that God rejects. And we wonder, are we the only ones left, Lord? And the song comes to our heart, how long, O Lord? The true church, the true church, not the visible structure church, but the true church is wondering today, are they the only ones left? Are, they, are, are we only here? Where are the others? They're asking, has God rejected the church? And the only correct answer, he's already given no. He has not rejected to whom he foreknew. So no matter what we see, no matter what the neglect or the reject or the rot that is taking place, God's election is sure. Verses 6 and 7. In case we took that last point to think that now we have to work harder and be better and now we have to work so God would accept us Paul then says but if it is by grace it's no longer on the basis of works otherwise grace is no longer grace what then what Israel is seeking it has not obtained but those who were chosen obtained it and the rest were hardened how beautiful is that how beautiful is grace? This is why we did the faithful remnant, the true church. This is the beauty of the true church. We stand, we preach, we obey, we suffer, we face adversity, and we're willing to die. Not because we're awesome, but because he is. That the whole world seems to be going to hell in a handbasket, but yet our eyes have been opened. We get it. We see it. He's called us. We can pray. We can preach. We can fast. The true church knows that salvation, as I said, is by grace through faith in Christ to the glory of God alone. But those who deny that truth is nothing more than Israel. Relying on works as a means of salvation. May I remind us of a scripture and then we'll get ready to get out of here. I want us to turn to Ephesians chapter 1 verse 11. Because I don't want you leaving here wondering, okay, I'm struggling in sin. Am I saved? I'm struggling with a couple areas in my life. Is it going to be okay? Because the reality is if you're struggling, it's going to be okay. (laughs) If you're not struggling and you think what you're doing is good, you're in trouble. But if you're struggling, it's okay. Because salvation is based upon God's election. It's not based upon your or my ability to work and appease God in our own righteousness. Listen to what God says through the Apostle Paul. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are at Ephesus, who are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us to adoptions as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace which he lavished on us. In all wisdom and insight, he made um, known to us the mystery of his will according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him, verse 10, with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of time, that is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and the things on the earth. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will. That's our hope. This is why all Israel, national Israel, ethnic Israel, could not understand it. This is why they couldn't obtain it. 
but those who have been chosen understand and obtained it. When you see the world getting harder, when you see the Christians who profess Christ get harder, when you see the religious get harder, do not take that as your failure. Take that as God showing you something, that they cannot obtain it because they think it's based on something else. Many men have spent more time in this scripture that we're in this morning arguing about their end times position, focusing only on Israel. But what I take from this is that no one here in this room or listening to this sermon, any Christian who professes Christ cannot look upon the established structure of the visible church as evidence of salvation. We can't. Just like much of Israel was established, Christianity too has rejected God. They have denied their master. And if you're sitting here and you're going, ouch, praise God. And if we're causing, if we're forced to do a self-reflection, praise God. If you're sitting here and everything that's being said is just like, well, I don't care. I don't need this. I didn't do anything wrong. I pray for you. I pray that your heart gets softened. We're seeing a great neglecting and rejection across Canada. The denial is evident within the seminaries, within the pulpits, within the pews. And in our day and age, we see great disobedience to the word. We see disobedience in world missions. We see disobedience all over the place, and it seems that the church is being neglected. There is an appearance of the church, but it's in rejection. If you go to many churches today to examine the fruits, now do not forget what I said about faithful remnant, okay? I don't want you leaving here and throwing tomatoes. Well, actually, you can throw tomatoes at me because at least I know I'm doing something right but I don't really want tomatoes thrown. It makes you think I'm, I'm beating everyone up here. I'm not. But we need to really look at these things. Disclaimer out of the way. But in our day and age, we see disobedience to the word of God, as I said, and all over the place, and what appears to be the Christian church actually is not. The evidence to that statement is if you walk into churches today, you will see quickly that the fruit in which they are producing is not stemmed from the gospel of Jesus Christ. I read an article the other day about a church being sued by the creators and writers of the the Broadway show Hamilton. And the church spent all this time and all this money to have everyone here to sit and watch a bunch of actors instead of just faithfully proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm glad they're getting sued. And let me say this. When you look around Canada and you see all these churches closing and you see them going bankrupt and you see the boards upon them, do not go by them in your heart and have sorrow that God just shut down another church. You faithfully rejoice that God has wiped out an unfaithful presence here in Mississauga or in Canada because God's church will not close. It cannot close. It says that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. God is pruning. God is stripping what is taking place in this nation. So the fruit is showing that they have neglected God. They have neglected the message of Jesus Christ. That the full devotion to Christ has been neglected. And this is why many denominations are rotten to the core. You can quote me on that. It's going to be on YouTube. It doesn't make me happy. Because in those churches, a faithful remnant is now looking for a new home. And he will deliver them. Remember what I said in the beginning, rotten fruit serves no purpose other than to feed the flies or the pigs. And that is why, for the most part, many churches seem too weak in power. Weak in power. We may have our theology and our doctrine, but weak in power. She is like ancient Israel consumed in her theology and her ideology, but they're rejecting the very Messiah in which they profess 
The church is so worldly. It's so worldly. That's why we have to have rock bands at the front. That's why people can't sit down for 45 minutes and listen to a sermon. But by God's grace, he has not rejected his people. As I said, I am glad many churches have closed down. And I'm also glad that the Holy Spirit will lead every single one of his true people to a sound congregation. It doesn't matter the denomination. It doesn't matter if it's Baptist or Presby. They will find a true home because the Spirit of the Lord leads his people. And I am so grateful that God has not rejected his church. You know why? Remember, it's always darkest just before the dawn. And I believe that God is about to do a great and mighty work in his church. I believe that we're about on the cusp of seeing a mighty move of God. As I said last week, we might even see a revival. We're seeing the rise of men standing up and preaching boldly again. We see men who are preaching repentance. We're seeing men preach the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ that no matter how much we fail, no matter how much we strive, no matter how much we fall, that we will be forgiven and all of our sin is cleansed and all of our transgressions is taken away through the most precious blood of Jesus Christ. They're rising up. But there's one last thing we have to do and then we're done. Repent. We all need to repent. We need to repent for years of apathy. We need to repent for years of diluting the gospel. We need to repent for our own hearts and our own lives. And repentance is not a bad thing. It doesn't mean we're not saved. It just means that we need to repent. Second Chronicles 7.14 is often used over Canada and other nations, but it's actually towards God, God's people, right? It's Israel, a Socratic people. We are God's people. And it says, my people, my people, who are called by my name, and humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will he- excuse me, hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. So when we come to this place of repentance, when we come to this place of brokenness, we move from mourning the closing of churches, as I said, to the place of rejoicing. Lord, you may have closed that church down in the corner. And I know people may be hurt and confused in their faith, but Lord, I know closing it doesn't mean you're done. Would you raise up another church on this corner? Would you raise up another church in this community that will preach and boldly proclaim your glorious gospel of Jesus Christ? We need to get back to those things. It's hard, isn't it? As I said, when I was writing this sermon, I had a lot of ouch moments. So if you're visiting today, if you've been here for a while and you are not accustomed to hearing these things, I just want to share a couple quick closing thoughts before communion. If the Old Testament system was going to be the the permanent system in place, we would all be in trouble because God knows our hearts. He knows the wickedness of our hearts and he knows that we cannot keep the holy law into which he put into effect himself. We know that we're liars, we're thieves, we're adulterers. We're blasphemers. We know this. But in all of these things, God did something so powerful. The scripture is true in 1 John 4.10. In this is love. Not that we love God. No, we hated God. But in this is love. Not that we love God, that he loved us. And he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. He came to die so that we may live. Truly God, truly man upon that cross. Jesus Christ. You can say that God, in a way, bled for us. That blood that was shed is the evidence that we are so wicked, that we are such in need, and that is the only thing that we have. But here's the beautiful part, dear church. We can call out to him. We can call out to God and and confess our sins and say, Lord, we need you. We need you as our Savior. 
We can confess our sins and say, I have failed. I have been focusing in the wrong areas. I've let the, the wrong things in. I have worshiped the idols. And for some of you, you've never known him. And say, I want to be saved from my sins and trust that he is willing and able to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And all it takes is faith to call out and say, Lord, save me. I don't want to be trapped in this thing called religion. I don't want to be in this blindness of, of established church. I want to be, I want to be yours. I want to be with you. And then when you walk with him, you will not succumb to all the dangers and all the pitfalls. But when you go to churches and when you're walking in your life, you'll be able to stand firm in his gospel. And you will be able to continue to move forward in his grace. 